of course, when we deal with angular momentum, you will be bombarded with questions about figure skaters. It's it's just unavoidable. But let me get into a little bit of why these kind of problems are introduced usually with angular momentum. If you look back on regular momentum, right? You have initial plus change equals final. And typically when we had dealt with one single body, there's usually some external impulse on the body because otherwise the two terms would be exactly the same, right? In the case where we have no external forces, then the question isn't that interesting at all because unless in super extreme circumstances, the mass of your object that you're interested in doesn't tend to change. And then therefore you have the starting speed equal to final speed. So that's not a very interesting question. There are of course collision question where instead of just the one term, we make it a bunch of terms, right? Multiple bodies in the same system. And then that's also interesting. But if you look at angular momentum, in the case that you also have no external torque, which makes the calculation easy. If you look at your angular momentum term though, for fixed rotation is I omega. So you have I omega here, I omega here. You can name these things differently because for the same body, it is possible to have a different moment of inertia. For a particular body, it's not very easy to change the mass of it. But remember, moment of inertia doesn't just depend on the mass, but also depends on how that mass is distributed around your body and around your axis of rotation. So you can very easily have the same body, same one body, but just simply change the shape of the body, which should be easy enough. And it still makes an interesting question. You can change your spin rate by changing your shape. And this of course happens in all kinds of situation, many different kinds of sports, diving, break dancing, and of course, figure skating. So of course the human body is not the simplest of shape. So here they idealize the shape for us a little bit so that it makes the calculation a little easier. If you really want to, you can of course put it all into a computer model and have the computer break up the person and do each piece of mass numerically and get everything exact, exact. But that's not our purpose here, right? Our purpose is just to kind of see this equation here can gives us a sense of uh, decreasing angular momentum will increase our angular velocity. So we again have a before and after. Before the person has the arm spread out. So in this case, she looks something like this. And then later on, she puts her arms up and she spins faster and faster. If you've seen figure skating at all, this is a pretty classic move. Although not everyone does the super fast spin, they like to do different shapes and whatnot as well. But this particular form demonstrates what we want to show the clearest. So instead of this human looking shape, which our table doesn't give us, we're going to say that this middle part here looks kind of like a single cylinder. And then each of these arms are kind of rods sticking out like that. And then afterwards you have the arms up. So let's say it's still kind of the same size cylinder, but taller. Notice that uh, before and after, right? You have 40 kilograms plus two arms. So that's 2.5 kilograms twice is 45 kilogram, which is the same as the mass afterwards. So your mass did not change which hopefully makes sense, right? As you drag your arms in, you don't expect your mass to change. You don't expect to lose mass just like that. But the spin rate does change because now the mass are distributed differently, right? With the arms out, there's a whole bunch of mass out here that's far away from the axis rotation, where afterwards that isn't the case. So let's look at the before case and figure out the moment of inertia first. So this here, in this case, is an object that has three pretty simple pieces. So we'll deal with each of these separately. So you got your body, and then you have arm, 
let's say your left arm and then your right arm, even though it's probably going to give you the same thing due to symmetry. If you look at it from above, axis of rotation right down the middle, so you're spinning that way. For your body, that is just the case of a solid cylinder with the axis going through like that. So that's one half mr square. So one half m b r b square. B standing for body. But for the arm here, the center of the arm is here, but the rotation axis is over there. So you have to do a delta r and therefore a parallel axis theorem. So then we have to look up the ICM, the moment inertia of the arm about its center of mass. That's parallel to this one. So we're dealing with a rod and the one through the center of mass like that, which is indeed parallel, right? Because the biggest cylinder will be like here and then it will kind of like that. That's parallel. And really, we really remember that we cannot start with this one because that is not the one through the center of mass. So we have 112 m arm l arm square. Same thing for the other arm. And then for delta r, there's no shift for the body because it's centered around the right spot. This delta r for the arm here is going to be half of your length plus the radius of the body, right? So that's going to be 0.33 meters because it's half of 66 centimeters. And then they give us against diameter. So the radius is half of that. So that's 0.1 meters together is 0.43 meters for both of them because one moves this way, one moves the other way and we square it. So the direction doesn't really matter. Some of you might ask why we chose the rod case instead of the cylinder case. Well, they are kind of the same, right? If you notice the saw cylinder through the same kind of axes, you're just keeping the second term, meaning you're implying that your radius is zero. And since the question itself haven't given us was the radius of the arm, we just assume it's too small to matter. So whenever you have a question of whether you want to use the rod form or the saw cylinder form, just see if the radius is given. If the radius is given, you might as well calculate out this one term. It may not be very big, but you never know. But in this case, it's not given, so we couldn't use that anyway. So we use the rod one. Now we, of course, use the parallel axis theorem, right? For each piece, we got to move it from its center of mass to where the axis of rotation is. So for the body, it's easy. Again, we want radius, not diameter. There's no shift. And I just wanted to explicitly calculate these numbers out, getting the numbers separately, just so that you kind of see the proportion relative of contribution to the moment of inertia. Because even though the arm is much, much lighter than the body, because the arms are spread out, the R, because R get squared in your moment of inertia calculation really has a big impact. Even though it's super light, you know, at least 10, 15 times lighter than the body itself, because it is stretched out that much further, the resulting moment of inertia is actually twice as big as the body itself. Then the other arm gives you the exact same number, of course. So knowing to write that RL again, units, of course, kilograms, meters square for moment of inertia. So the total then for that entire shape we added up is that. For your second body, it's nice and simple. Just one big tall cylinder around that axis. The length or the height doesn't actually make a difference because that direction runs parallel to my axis of rotation. And so the added mass here made the moment of inertia just a little bit bigger than just the body itself. So again, angular momentum, initial plus change equals final. It is still good to probably double check that we have no external torque. The forces at play here is pretty much just mg and fn. Friction is expected to be small. And both of these force goes right through and acts along my axis of rotation. So there's no torque as a result. So indeed, this middle term is zero. The rotational axis is fixed and everything just revolves around that one axis so we can use i omega again since none of the actual direction are specified they just want the speed it should be clear that the direction of the 
initial and final should remain the same because moment inertia won't change the sign of these things. I'm not going to just randomly change direction because you change shape. It stays the same direction. The magnitude will be different, of course, because the final moment inertia is substantially smaller than the initial. As for the angular speed, because they give us to us in rev per second, and in the end they want rev per second, so it's okay probably just to keep it not converted. Because we have to do all the conversion back again. No point really. So from one revolution per second, which is already pretty fast spinning, you can ramp it up to 5.8, so almost 6 revolution per second. So these figure skaters have a special technique not to get dizzy, but it's definitely beyond my capability. But that is all it takes. Just bring your arms in and you spin almost six times as fast. Now if you want to really change your moment inertia, that's why sometimes you see moves like these, right? Your leg has, and your torso has a lot more mass than just your tiny arms, and they can spread out even further. So if you start looking in this shape with this axis right in the middle, you can really change your angular speed by coming together.